move on to our next uh, speaker, um, Stephen Arnold from Rodman Research Institute in Canada. And he's going to uh, talk about defacing and curation for sharing brain MR imaging data. Please, the floor is yours, Stephen. Thanks, Florian. Um, let's see if I can share. All set, you can see that? Great. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna give an overview of some defacing and data curation strategies. It's actually a nice talk to follow up from Greg's uh, talk, highlight some of the things he had mentioned. Um, here's my disclosure slide. And uh, sort of a lot of the work I'm presenting is taking place in the context of the Ontario Brain Institute, which is a provincially funded not-for-profit organization uh, in Ontario. Uh, it's uh, achieves some of its goals through their Center for Ontario Data Exploration or Brain Code, uh, which is a, another repository. Um, and it's, um, it's sort of centered around um, uh, six, uh, six integrated discovery projects here. Um, centered around brain disease. Uh, so there's a neurodegenerative disease uh, cohort, depression project and neurodevelopmental disorders, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, and concussion. Um, each of these programs are characterized by sort of deep phenotyping in the sense that uh, they're collecting neuropsych data, clinical omics, wearable sensor data, and a host of neuroimaging studies. Uh, uh, currently, there's uh, over 17,000 imaging data sessions on, on brain code, and uh, half of them are MRI. Um, and that's what I would like to talk about today, specifically how we make those data available for external use uh, and sort of the, some of the pitfalls to uh, you should be aware of uh, in terms of uh, sensitive information. Um, currently, there's a we're actively releasing some of the neurodegenerative uh, disease baseline tabular data. Uh, and in the new year, there'll be depression and can bind uh, data and the neurodevelopmental disorder. There's more in information on the Brain Institute website here. Um, each project uh, is collecting MR data. Uh, they have their own uh, protocols, but they typically involve uh, structural T1, T2, DTI and uh, fMRI scans, resting state and task-based. Uh, so in the brief time that I have, I'll discuss about how we de-identify data, um, talk about uh, including removing uh, identifiable protected health information in the form of text, as well as uh, facial features in the image. Uh, and I'll briefly mention some uh, words about standardization and curation. Uh, one of the things that I'll highlight throughout uh, this talk is the importance of uh, manual review. Uh, while the software tools are really great, uh, there really is no substitute for a human eyes on the data at some point in the whole process just to, uh, to flag some things that otherwise get missed. Uh, the de-identification of MR data, like most other biomedical data, is informed by the uh, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA. Uh, um, sort of the, the privacy rule in 2002 uh, required that those people in charge of the, or holding those data have to uh, um, uh, sort of apply proper administrative, technical, physical uh, safeguards to protect the data um, and make sure that uh, individually identifiable health information, also known as protected health information or PHI is removed. Uh, two ways they sort of said that there are ways uh, to, um, De identify these data. One is through an expert determination. So if you have somebody versed in statistical methods, scientific methodology, and can document and determine that there's a very low risk of uh, revealing uh, patient information or identity, then that would deem de-identified data. But probably the more popular option is the, the safe harbor method, where uh, as long as you're removing uh, a list of, of identifiers, direct identifiers, indirect identifiers, then the data are deemed safe to be shared. And these would claim, uh, include obvious things like full names, uh, addresses of people, patient, uh, uh, license plates, anything like that. One thing I will highlight that's important for MR data is uh, this uh, option of full face photographs and any comparable images. 
Uh, right. So MR data coming off the scanner are usually in some form of, form of raw format. Typically, this is DICOM format, and Greg had mentioned this. Uh, stands for Digital Imaging and Communications in Medicine, developed by the American College of Radiology. Um, and it was developed as a standard for internationally accepted format to view, archive, and retrieve uh, share medical images. A DICOM file really consists of two layers. There's the, the viewable image itself here. And then there's uh, a header file, it's typically hidden from view, but any DICOM editor can, can pull that down this information and access it. And it really contain, contains literally uh, dozens, if not hundreds of uh, uh, DICOM fields. Uh, uh, they're hexadecimal values uh, characterized by a standard data group and element number. It's all standardized. So if I blow up a couple here, uh, here, group 0010 is uh, coding for sort of information about the patient or the subject. Uh, element 10 is the patient's name, element 30, the patient's birth date, and that sort of thing. So uh, it's these sort of tags that you would have to be sensitive to and you want to remove if you're sharing these or de-identifying these data sets. Uh, luckily, there are uh, many um, uh, software that's in files that uh, can access these DICOM uh, files and, and remove or redact uh, that type of information. Uh, DICOM edit, DICOM browse are some examples. Uh, there, and there are also lots of resources that uh, sort of recommend the fields that should be uh, appropriate for redaction depending on uh, what, you, uh, what you're looking at. An example here is a clinical trials uh, redaction uh, standard. Uh, so the software uh, is only as good uh, as, uh, as, the, uh, as the DICOM field is entered. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, PHI can be missed sometimes. So if an MR tech uh, uh, inserts PHI in an unexpected field that you're not, uh, not uh, pulling apart or you're not redacting, then uh, PHI can get through. Uh, there are also private vendor tags that uh, are incorporated uh, in addition to the standard DICOM tags. And, and those can be somewhat problematic. So uh, for these reasons and others, many researchers often opt uh, for an open data repository or, or choose really to, to convert it from a DICOM format into something a little more uh, 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 manageable and uh, less prone to uh, PHI. Uh, one popular uh, um, format in brain imaging now is the, uh, is the, the NIFTY format or the Neuroimaging Informatics Technology Initiative. Um, whereas a, 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 um, an MRI scan or a seri pulse sequence contains many uh, DCM DICOM files to comprise the whole brain volume. Uh, those are but including a 2D image and all those DICOM headers in each file. Uh, a nifty file is one sort of a 3D volume of all of those DCM files together. So you have one file, uh, that's been stripped down of all the DICOM information and just holds the basic imaging uh, 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 metrics that allow it to uh, display that image correctly. Um, in terms of uh, DICOM to NIFTY converters, there are also many uh, tools for that. We tend to use the um, DCM to the NIX uh, converter from Chris Rorden's lab. Uh, it has a nice option that in addition to the NIFTY file, it can also create um, uh, sort of a, uh, an adjoining uh, text file that uh, contains valuable parameters uh, from that uh, from the DICOM information, uh, including slice order and uh, time acquisition, that uh, sort of thing that would be necessary for people down the road that want to analyze the data. Um, right, and so the text in the headers and the other type of text I wanted to mention is that text that can show up in the image itself. Um, so it's important to check uh, through the images that uh, are going to be shared that there is no uh, PHI in, or if there is any text in the, in the image that there's no PHI. There's a DICOM field that, uh, that codes for this, um, group 28 to 301, uh, and it's coded as burned in annotation. So uh, yes or no is the, the entry. Um, and if, uh, and I think the TCIA uh, de-identifier that you're talking about, Greg, actually has a, uh, part of that is to go through and look for these sort of yes tags and then uh, you flag images and then I think it has a text identifier and can redact uh, PHI. Um, 
but like other software, I would mention that sometimes uh, software can miss uh, stuff uh, burned in text. So we found uh, files that have uh, text in them, but the uh, the DICOM field is missing that would indicate that. And sometimes we've even found uh, DICOM burned in annotation mark as no, uh, yet there's still text in there. Um, so again, uh, manualize it. it I mean, going through uh, taking half a day to just to scan through a whole pile of images just to check for this uh, isn't that much of a, a burden in the long run uh, for uh, eliminating this PHI. So that's text. The other, next thing I'll talk about is uh, defacing facial features. So an MR image is capturing more than just the brain. It's imaging the entire head, including uh, the skull and surface features of the, uh, of the head and face. Uh, most 3D image software uh, or MR viewer have a capability of making a surface projection or a 3D render. Uh, so this is a 3D T1 scan uh, that can be rendered into a, a surface projection with surprising amount of detail in it. Um, uh, I mean, minus the hair and uh, uh, some of the skin pigmentation, it, it's quite a, a a photographic like image in there. So it certainly qualifies in the uh, as a full face photograph or uh, any kind of comparable image and it's PHI that you would want to remove if you're sharing this information. Um, not just 3D T1 scans, but here's a, an, FM, uh, an MRI session that contained a T1 sequence of flare, uh, simultaneous PD T2. T2 star fMRI and DTI. And I did use this, this is using a mango freely available Mango software has a render uh, capability and uh, the anatomical images in particular have quite a bit amount of detail. So as long as the field of view has captured the, uh, the face, uh, that information is in there and, and should be removed before sharing. Uh, you can even see the, uh, the fiducial markers here that are intact on the side of the face. Uh, and some of you who are observant out there may even see that the, the subject is yours truly. Uh, this is a scan I participated in, um, so I, I give my consent to share my, my face here. Um, but it's not just human, um, human observers either. Uh, facial rec recognition software can identify people from MR images, and some of you may recall a, a, a rather infamous paper a couple years ago from uh, the Mayo Clinic showing that uh, uh, they had 84 volunteers uh, who had participated in the MRI. They consented to have their 3D renders created and they submitted photographs and uh, computer software, Microsoft Azure was able to uh, uh, sort of identify or pair up the photo with the 3D render on 83% of, uh, uh, of the time. So 70 of the 84 participants were uh, uh, linked up and identified. Uh, and this made a lot of splash. Uh, New York Times and other media outlets picked it up, um, in particular because other uh, some of the large consortia had actually released MR data. And while they'd redacted the, the DICOM information, the facial features are still in there. Um, of course, people, when they're signing on to get access to these data, are usually signing off that they won't try to do anything nefarious with the data. But uh, nevertheless, once it's out there, uh, people can do what they want with it. So. Um, nowadays, most open source and repositories deface the data. UK Biobank, ADNI, Human Connectome Project, and certainly BrainCode uh, and OBI were interested in that sort of thing too. Uh, yeah, we can move on to talk about how to remove facial features from images. There are three broad methods, uh, skull stripping, defacing, and facial blurring. Uh, kind of a grotesque name, but skull stripping is exactly that. It's uh, uh, the skull is easily picked up as a, a bright object in a T1 scan, and so you can uh, localize the skull and remove that and anything beyond it. Uh, and you've done a great job of removing uh, any facial identity there. So you're just left with the 3D brain, and there's no chance of re-identifying that person unless you know what their brain looks like. Um, problem with it, and so this is really is the gold standard for defacing. Um, Problem with this is that uh, you're removing the, uh, the skull, which is often used or can be used for uh, sort of boundary and uh, um, uh, landmarks for imaging data. Um, 
the fiducial markers that I showed you in the other example would have been removed in this case. So that's another thing. Uh, not having the skull boundary also limits some kinds of metrics or calculations that uh, people may want to do with the data later. So total injury is cerebral volume or cerebral spinal fluid calculations can't be made if the skull is missing. Um, at the other extreme, uh, you can leave all that information intact, uh, localize where the facial features are, and then just blur those out so that when you reconstruct construct the 3D image, <clears throat> the person or the, the face isn't uh, identifiable anymore because it's been distorted so much. Um, what sounds like a good idea uh, was shown to be not so good a couple of years ago because a, a deep learning approach showed that uh, uh, these facial blurring can actually be undone uh, and you can restore the, the actual original image again. Um, so the third option sort of lies somewhere in between. It's actually doing what the facial blurring is doing in that it's leaving the, the skull uh, intact, but uh, once it identifies the facial, facial features, it removes them entirely, sets them to an intensity value of zero or whatever. Uh, and so the only thing you're concerned with there is whether you're removing any brain regions or, and or that you've removed enough facial features. Uh, there's nothing left over that would remain uh, identifiable. Um, Here's a couple of images. This is a, a full 3D render of a non-defaced images. And this is what the 3D render looks like of this defaced image. Um, you see the fiducial marker still intact. Uh, there's still some features that left over, but uh, you'd have a hard time identifying this person. We've also included an ear mask removal because ears have been shown to be a, an identifiable characteristic of people as well. Uh, so really it's this um, uh, defacing thing that we're interested in looking at or these defacing approaches uh, we are assessing for brain code in OBI. Uh, you can follow up on a study we carried out uh, earlier this year published uh, where we evaluated six uh, open um, source or openly av freely available de uh, defacing programs, AFNI Refacer, Deep Defacer, MRI Deface, MRI Defacer, Pi Deface, and Quick Shear. Um, this work was led by Athena Thayer, a senior research assistant in, the, in our lab, and she did the bulk of uh, this amazing work here. We've got, uh, we took 300 images from the Andre, from the OBI repository, 100 from the Andre cohort, which is an older cohort, 100 from a middle-aged group in the depression cohort, and 100 from the pediatric uh, pond network. So we had 300 images that we applied six defacers and one skull stripper. So we ended up with 2,100 images. And then we had three, <laughs> three human reviewers sit down for a couple of weeks and uh, sit, sift through these in a random order and uh, just uh, make a couple of decisions whether and what uh, facial features remained and whether any voxels in the brain had been removed. Uh, here are the results. and. Uh, on the left side, we've shown uh, the uh, skull stripping method. So this is the gold standard. Uh, and uh, a correctly defaced scan is one that could not be record or didn't have any facial features. Maybe uh, one partial facial feature was allowed uh, and it didn't remove any brain voxels. So skull stripper uh, performed admirably on all three data sets. The one case that it missed in one subject, there was a, uh, uh, it removed some of the brain uh, regions. So. In terms of defacers, two defacers showed uh, to do almost as well as the skull stripper. That was the AFNI refacer and PI deface. Uh, uh, and some did better on, than others on, uh, on the age cohort as well. So whereas the uh, AFNI refacer didn't do quite so well on the younger co cohort, but did quite well on the older cohorts, it was reversed for PI deface. So we now have tools that we can use to assess different or to deface different types of uh, cohorts uh, within uh, the imaging group. Uh, and yeah, there are several other results I'll, uh, I could go into, but I'll just refer you to the paper. Uh, it, importantly, it does minimal. We looked at uh, um, how effective it was at, uh, uh, at uh, preventing recognition. So we carried another experiment where uh, people were looking at familiar faces that have been defaced and AFNI refacer and PI deface came out <coughs> on top again. Uh, Minimal brain removal was involved in all of these half a percentage of the entire voxels that were removed, mainly in the frontal cortex or uh, under the temporal lobe. Uh, and we ran it through a couple of pre-processing pipelines to see if it impacts uh, data down the road and it, didn't, it was very minimal. 
Um, right, so I think I'm almost out of time here, but in the final point, I'll just say that standardization and cur uh, curation, um, moving towards reproducible science, the fair, findable, accessible, uh, reproducible science that uh, we were talking about is important. Uh, you need to document all these steps, including the defacers that were used for each data set, ideally. Um, and standardizing it into some sort of machine readable format. Uh, Greg, I can say brain imaging data structure from a, a brain perspective it is a very important and uh, worthwhile cause. It's a lot of time has been invested in this and, it, uh, and lots of pipelines are looking for bids uh, re ready sort of data sets to input into their pipeline. So yeah, that's uh, bids is certainly one worth uh, following up on. <clears throat> Yeah, so in summary, uh, de-identification of MR involves replacement and redaction of PHI from the header as well as the image, removal of facial features um, from higher resolution anatomical scans, ideally defacing, uh, seems to be the best of both worlds. And if you're converting data from raw format into anything else like Nifty or down the road, you should have a record of what the software was used uh, um, uh, as well as uh, uh, sort of highlighted the importance of uh, having manual review throughout the, uh, the importance of data standardization. Yep, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Stephen, um, for this great talk. Are there any questions from the audience? Maybe to, to start us off, uh, you mentioned the process of still, even though you use software tools to remove uh, DICOM tags, um, like PHI um, related ones, that there is still the requirement to check everything manually. So that is a fairly tedious task if you're dealing with large data sets. Um, and I remember that we, we struggled with this when we, when we had the, the fast MRI data release and it, it's, it was quite an effort, um, but I guess there is no way around it. Or... Well, yeah, I agree. Um, and yeah, when you start to get into the thousands and like that, it is it is difficult. But in, in those sort of cases, I would recommend at least spot checking, like take an example of each of the institution or each of the scanners and, and have a quick look at that and see if there's any problems there. And then you, you can sort of narrow down your focus on the, where do we tend to, yeah. I have a question. Sure. So um, still on that uh, de-identification, de um, you talked quite a bit about all the um, aspects of de-identifying DICOM data. Um, and, you know, one way to get around that is to just use a different format, like Nifty. Do you think we should just not be using DICOM for research purposes then? Like, are we collecting too much data if we use DICOMs? And also I'm like, wondering about other anatomies as well outside the brain community, if, if you could comment on that as well. Yeah, I, I would say, um, I don't think it's a, it's a bad thing to collect DICOM. And, and, and so OBI and, and brain code do a good job of, uh, they incorporate this in their informed consent language that, you're giving permission to put it up into brain code. It's a zone one. Uh, I mean, it's a very secure platform. Only immediate people that are privy to that, uh, that are on that informed consent can access those data. So mm -hmm. it's a secure place where you to hold it. And when the data are released, they move into another zone altogether after they've gone through de-identification. But what's important is that that DICOM information always lives in that secure zone. Um, so you can go back and, because down the road, things will change. Uh, uh, maybe a defacing program was found to be, uh, uh, I don't know, have errors in it and you want to go back and re redo that data set. So I would recommend if you can find a secure zone to, to house those DICOM, it's, it's worth keeping uh, that raw format uh, at some point. Yeah. I see. Thank you. We have one other question just coming in from the chat, or actually there are a couple. Um, if you do working on image reconstruction, then, or processes that are even closer to the, to the, to the scanner or the image generation, then what you need is the raw data. So that the raw case-based data, 
And uh, do you have any thoughts on how to share those when it comes to high-res 3D data sets? Because then the defacing is, how, how would you do it? Yeah, we've actually encountered that a bit uh, in brain code as well as then we're doing some work with uh, um, Sherida Hospital in, in Berlin and they have a virtual research environment. Um, and in those cases, there's secure platforms where you have a workspace and you can, uh, from you get your own workspace where you can the data are downloaded to and you're allowed to work within that workspace on the data uh, and then you take those results out but the data never leave the uh, the secure platform so that's mm -hmm. one way to get around it but it, it is a problem especially when you're working with um, multiple institutions and, and trying to work across borders thank you um in the interest of time, there's one other question, but I think it may be addressed in the hands-on. Um, so in the interest of time, let's move on. Um, let, or first, let's uh, thank Stephen again. <laughs>